it seems that China itself is slowing down again, right? And this was something you talked about extensively, I think, uh, roughly last year. Do you think it's now coming to a, a critical point there? Well, there are there are big problems with China in that, you know, that there, there is a, an excess of leverage within the country, uh, largely tied to the real estate bubble, you know, and by that, I just, once again, there's no judgment in here, but the average Chinese person has really only one investment uh, opportunity, which is real estate within China. And that became a huge bubble. And in a country where, you know, up, uh, what, 30 years ago, you were not allowed to own real estate. So when people own real estate, they make money on it. And then everyone decides the best thing to do is to own real estate. And you have this, this bubble form. But you then end up in a situation where real estate relative to incomes in China is probably the most expensive in the world. And entire families pool their money in order to buy a home that is sort of supposed to be a, a generator of wealth or a retirement plan. It's very problematic for the country if that bubble, both for the individuals and for the country, if that bubble bursts. The, the problem is that this bubble has been inflating you know, at first, the, the increases in real estate value in China made sense. But probably for the last 20 years, uh, it's been an inflating bubble. And politicians have sort of chosen to kick it down the road, which is what politicians in every part of the world do. No one wants a crisis to occur on their watch. But right now, you know, with Evergrande and everything else, the three red lines and so on, we are seeing that the air coming out of the real estate bubble in China. Yeah. And then... And, but, but you do see you some, also, somewhat of a um, an interesting thing there, though, that, that they recognized it quite early on, no? And then they seem to do something about it, but then they always seem to pull back again when it, well, when it gets do. too far. And, and this is just the nature of politicians always... You know, you sort of have to stay in power and you want, you know, things to look good when, when you were in charge. And so in many ways, like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not a huge fan of Xi. In fact, I think, uh, you know, I think he's sort of trying to move China back to that sort of Maoist uh, country. Like, I, I don't agree with a lot of what he's doing, but he is, uh, at some point, a day of reckoning kind of has to come whenever there's a bubble. And in a way, what he's done is force it to be now rather than in five years time when it's inflated even further. And so it's almost back to our discussion of the financial crisis or whatever, that once in a while pain has to occur. You know, there are gains and losses and we can pretend to not have any losses for a long time. But at a, at a certain point, the, the chickens come home to roost. And so China does have that problem. They equally have this issue, you know, the zero COVID policy that they've been pursuing. Uh, at first, it was thought that they were just doing this in the lead up to the Olympics, you know, that they kind of wanted to to sort of do this uh, for, for a short mm, while. Yeah. But now it sort of seems like an endless uh, lockdown, which, you know, has to be hugely economically harmful, like to to shut down all sorts of businesses and factories and everything in the country. And then you have this issue of emerging markets that they've lent money to being unable to repay them. And so, you know, there, there are, China is experiencing a lot of difficulties. And there, there's even that, uh, you know, actually, I, I, I saw uh, you on Twitter retweeted a, a very good post uh, from Michael Pettis, maybe yeah. about a week ago, on the comparison between China and Japan. And basically, you know, there, there's kind of this, uh, what do they call it? Like the middle, middle income, um, trap. Middle income uh, trap. gap, yeah, where, where countries throughout mm. economic history struggle to move from that sort of high growth, uh, sort of world's factory economy into a mature economy and it's almost it's it's kind of the problem of emerging markets is that they're always emerging and it's very rare that you see one emerge you know like there's probably uh, two examples of emerging markets that emerged were probably korea south korea and the united states you know and other than that the others just emerge and emerge but kind of constantly 
collapse when uh, when they get to to this turning point because it's very difficult, you know, to flip from one type of economy into another. Yeah, no, that that is definitely very difficult. Maybe we could add uh, Taiwan and uh, and Singapore to to that list. 